Okay, welcome. Welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for joining. I guess we slowly get started. Um, on behalf of Andrea, Andreas and myself, I'm very happy to welcome you to our new edition of our seminar, Digital Science for Direct Discovery. And uh, what we aim for is to bring really everyone interested in the topic of digital science for direct discovery together, scientifically across discipline and in principle also personally. <laughs> and for now we uh, can only do that uh, virtually, unfortunately, but the goal is at some point also to have in-person meetings in Berlin as soon as this is possible again. And so we'll have two scientific talks normally, and we'll that will be followed uh, by a sort of like a virtual networking, and as I said before, maybe a real networking at some point. And and who is we? As I mentioned, it's it's, it's Andrea Volkhammer working at Charité, Andreas Bender uh, working now at Terra Lumina, and myself, um, um, I'm working uh, at Bayer in Berlin. And so we also have a mix now of startup, pharma, and university. Um, yeah. So we, today we have two talks, but already I would want to make you uh, um, aware of our next event. So we're currently planning the next event for the 5th of May. And uh, we will, registration will be available on our webpage. And uh, main meetings will be recorded and the presentations will be made available afterwards if the speakers agree to do so. So we won't be able to share all uh, recordings, but uh, we will share the recordings that where we have permission to do so. And some housekeeping. So if you have questions, please type your, don't hesitate to ask any questions and please type your questions in the chat window, also uh, along the presentation and we will go through them orally after the talk. Um, so I guess we have plenty of time. Let's see. <laughs> and uh, if there, are, if, if you can't follow up all um, all questions, then ideally the speakers would follow up by chat for the remaining questions. And uh, yeah, after the last talk, please stay with us. We'll have sort of like a, a Zoom online gathering, and you'll be put into um, automatically into virtual um, in breakout rooms, and uh, you can yeah, meet old friends, new friends, and have a chat. Exactly. And last but certainly not least, if you if you wish to present at our, one of our upcoming meetings, please let us know. And uh, also happy to to share the information about this series with every anyone that might be interested. And with that, we're coming slowly to start our program. And it's a pleasure um, for me to introduce our first speaker, Florian Montanara. Um, Florian did her PhD at the University of Vienna with Gerhard Ecker working on um, predicting inhibition of liver ABC transporters and in 2017 she joined Bayer and I guess this is also when we first met Florian and she is working in the machine learning research team of, of Oco Clevert and she's really an integral part of a team that we call the predict team which is a cross-functional team that is developing our prediction model platform. And I would, I would like to especially highlight that apart from her scientific work, she is really a great teacher and she's always ready to share her knowledge with others and really enable them to do their own model building. And with that, I am hand over to you and uh, very happy to have you. And today, uh, Florian will give us an introduction to explainable artificial intelligence for small molecules. Yeah, sounds good. Great. Thanks a lot, Floriana, for your contribution. Um, yeah, our next speaker will be Günter Klambauer. So he's a tenure track assistant professor in Linz. Uh, he's working both on methods as well as applications in the life sciences. Uh, so self-normalizing neural networks, for example, was one of his big uh, papers recently. Uh, and today he's here and talking about deep learning methods for chemical reactivity. Günter, please go ahead. Uh, Andreas, and uh, thanks, uh, and Clara, thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak and uh, yes, um, um, first, before I start, I want to also acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, so EIDD project, UCP, MateSmart, where actually the most of the things that I'm talking about came out of, and uh, Merck, and also the work that I will be showing is, is of course done by very by people in my group, uh, the AI and life science group at uh, the LS Unit Linz. Uh, in this case, that's mostly Philip Seider's work and with support of all the others that I want to thank at this point. 
So before we start, uh, this is uh, going to be a talk about um, uh, machine learning for chemical reactions and yeah, the things that uh, um, mostly reported in, uh, so I will give you, of course, an overview of the methods that are out there. <clears throat> then I will focus uh, towards the end on, on a recent publication here on chemical reactions. Uh, if you want to slides, they are available on, uh, I just shared them before I started the talk on my Twitter account. And uh, of course, uh, the work builds on fantastic prior work by <clears throat> all these guys, Marvin Sieger, um, Nadine Schneider, Philipp Schwaller. Uh, yes, uh, they uh, uh, contributed a, a lot of really cool methods. I will be talking about them. Connor Coley, uh, I should not forget. So uh, if you want to have the, the references to all this, I also put them together in a, in a bibliography that you can download. Okay, so I will still, I will start my talk uh, a bit with talking about AI, machine learning and deep learning a bit to get uh, everyone on board. And then I will show in, in, this, in part two, I will show uh, how you can go about uh, approaching chemical reactions with machine learning and deep learning methods. Uh, also introducing these reaction rules, then uh, appro approaches that use translation techniques from natural language processing then a bit classical neural network with it perform classification and then on top uh, retrieval and some uh, experimental results. So yeah, uh, also in, in the talk before, of course, this, all these terms have been used uh, uh, several times, AI, machine learning, deep learning. So of course, most of the things that we hear today when we talk about AI, we actually use a neural network which comes out of machine learning. So these are these techniques where you learn from data. And since around 2010, 2012, we have special techniques within machine learning that have uh, that are these neural networks that have layers, stacked layers of operating units. And because there are many layers, usually it's called deep learning. And this became famous, of course, for uh, being able to process and classify uh, images from computer vision. So what is so different about machine learning than uh, anything before? So in, I would say a traditional computer scientist has to give a very specific instruction how to solve a problem. For example, if you want to sort numbers, uh, the programmer comes up with an algorithm, bubble sort or quick sort or whatever. And the programmer also already solves the problems and then gives the computer instruction via a program how to solve the problem. Uh, we, we machine learners are a bit lazy. We would basically just show some data. So we would show the computer some unsorted numbers and sorted numbers and figure out an algorithm themselves. So for, especially for the sorting, machine learning is probably not a really cool technique, but for, let's say you have pictures of, of cars and, and bikes, uh, we would go, we would not like define a rule that something like uh, anything that has less than three wheels is a bike and everything that has more than three wheels is a car. We would just tell the machine learning method, okay, this is category zero cars and category one bikes, go figure out a function with adaptive parameters that can discriminate. So I want to plug in an image of the thing or uh, some other description of the object and you should give me the correct category and you're allowed to learn, so to adjust couple of parameters and these functions are usually the neural networks for deep learning and the parameters are adaptive connections between neurons. So this deep learning is actually neural networks together with very fast computers, massive data. And because these layers are stacked, many, many layers are stacked, we call it deep learning. Um, some of the networks that you will encounter are maybe uh, even in, in chem informatics nowadays in drug discover are not even that deep. Sometimes you uh, have good performance with a two, three layer network, depending on, on what you want to do. For example, if you want to build a QSA model. And so here's also, here would be, uh, yeah, I would say five layer network with four adaptive weight matrices. And already here, if it would be a very small neural network. So you would plug in a molecule, for example, here, or molecular descriptors 
then you just learn some hidden features. And here this could produce three different outputs. For example, if you have three different categories of molecules, you could have an output layer that predicts in which categories these um, molecules would fall. And all these, you, you see that there are many, these connection, adaptive connections that during a training fa phase, you would adapt. And often, of course, uh, we uh, in, in deep learning, we're often accused to just, if, if something doesn't work, we would just add a couple of more layers and see if we can solve the problem. And however, we, I think it's a bit more complicated. So deep learning uh, came up with a lot of uh, cool new algorithms uh, and architectures. If you have a large data set and some compute power, it's usually working. And we will see also today that this, uh, we don't even need that large data set. So there's uh, all these new advances called few shot learning, zero shot learning, where the, sp the special focus is on uh, learning fast uh, algorithms that can really adapt fast on very few data. Okay, so um, this was a very brief introduction to AI machine learning and deep learning, of course, uh, and uh, just uh, as a main idea that as soon as we have data, we would use these deep learning techniques to learn from the data to solve some of the problems. And in generally, so in general, um, these are five areas that are often mentioned uh, when it comes to AI methods, deep learning methods and drug discovery. So here I'm, I'm referencing a paper by <clears throat> guys from AstraZeneca, Ola Inquist, and Hongming Chen. And, and here we have this activity and property prediction method. So uh, here app would take in a molecule and predict some property. I think this also relates back to the uh, a bit more to the <clears throat> presentation before me where uh, often interpretability is, is, served, is seeked for uh, such a QSAR function that predicts activity. But of course, there have also been a lot of methods developed for generating molecules. So uh, based on a, out a recurrent neural network and LSTM, based on GANs, based on normalizing flows, uh, whatever you name it, the variational autoencoders. Uh, then uh, image analysis. So there's also plenty of uh, work on if you have to, if you do not work on the chemical structure but rather on uh, for example microscopy images to which uh, molecules have been administered and these have morphological changes that might be picked up uh, on an image by a convolutional network for example so these are some of the prime or the first uh, deep learning techniques that came up and that were successful Overall, it's about learning to represent molecules. So these chemical descriptors that we've already heard, maybe even quantum chemical descriptors, also 3D conformation, this all relates to how, or, or even smiles and graph. This relates to the problem of how to represent, uh, have, have a meaningful representation of a molecule. And for representation learning, we can use these neural networks because they learn in their different layers, they learn increasingly abstract representations. So they learn to abstract from the graph into some space where you have good representations. And uh, today we, um, I'm talking about this area where we have uh, chemical where we apply or we might try to learn methods for chemical reaction and synthesis planning. So uh, by the way, please also ask a lot of questions on the chat. Um, I think it's very fast what I'm presenting uh, and I have a lot of slides, so I'm happy to go into details uh, at any time. So there are data sets about chemical reactions. So this might be some within a group in a pharmaceutical company, but there are also public databases that report chemical reactions, maybe in some structured form, maybe some unstructured form, but definitely there is some knowledge from which we want to learn. And, and computer assisted synthesis and planning is a decade old uh, idea that we use the computer to help us with this problem of, of chemical synthesis. So why is it so important? Think of a, 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 you give someone a molecule and uh, this person has to find a way to synthesize this molecule in a series of chemical reactions from easily available starting products. And this is, uh, since there are many options, there are high 
is a high branching factor. So at each step, you have many, many options, like uh, also in playing chess, for example, you have many options and it's, it's a difficult problem. And also here, uh, the idea is that a uh, deep learning method and AI can help to do this efficiently. So this is the problem that we want to tackle. It can, uh, on, on the one hand, so chemical synthesis is a, a, as a multi-step process. You are given a molecule and you have to find a way how to synthesize it from starting products. As an analogy, maybe a simple analogy, I came up with, with the following. Think about someone shows you uh, a picture of a dish of, of some meal and you have to come up with a recipe, with a cookbook, how to cook this uh, dish. And this is a, a quite hard problem. And this, this is what has been tackled by in a seminal work by also yeah, by Marvin Segler um, with Monte Carlo Tree Search. And yeah, so this uh, multi-step process is recursively disassembled into, into individual single step retrosynthesis problems. So you, you disassemble a molecule and then you have maybe two molecules and then you disassemble, you check whether you have these molecules easily available and then you continue with the dis disassembly process. There could also be other things, uh, a lot of uh, other things like uh, forward, you get a, a series of uh, reactants and you try to predict the products which can also be done by neural networks also inferring reaction there's also plenty of work on um, inferring reaction conditions um, and predict uh, predicting reaction yields and so on so um, all of these uh, methods that have been developed are also strongly simplifying the problems for example they are all, often the simplifications taken that uh, the, there are no reaction conditions to be inferred or that there's only a single product molecule and so on and so forth. So uh, usually none of these methods or none of these methods aim to grasp chemical reactivity in, in its full, uh, uh, yeah, in its fullest. So breaking it down to something very simple is a uh, single step, uh, so re reaction prediction. Uh, you're given us, let's two, say two reactants, what would be the outcome of this chemical reaction or single step retrosynthesis, you're given a product, um, what uh, reactants are behind that. So either to, to, for this way, the machine learning method has to come up with the product or given the product, it has to come up with the reactants. And I want to show four different approaches to that. And this is uh, reaction rules, then translation methods, classification methods, and retrieval methods. And you see that here, the problem is already broken down as a single step uh, creature synthesis. So we do, do not do multiple steps, only single steps. So what are these reaction rules? Uh, they are sometimes called reaction templates. And you can imagine that uh, this, the, this is as a kind of blueprint of a chemical reaction. So let's say you have in a database this chemical reaction. <clears throat> And uh, you have some extraction algorithm, which could also be taken by a human, for example, that says a blueprint, okay, this, yeah, this is in some syntax that is similar to the smile syntax. Uh, usually it's uh, smart, but think about the yeah, breaking bond between carbon and oxygen, then form a new bond between oxygen and carbon, break another bond and then form a bond. So, so this is, yeah, just formalized in a computer, in a more readable language for a computer. But think about something like that. You look at the database, you go through, or the algorithm looks at the database uh, entries, so chemical reactions, and extracts the chemical rules that could be behind that. Of course, this is a problem on its own. So um, uh, it, the rule should encode which substructures are required and how the reactants are transformed into products and they can either be designed by experts or extracted. However, you can make them very complex, these rules, or very simple. If you make them com uh, very complex, so including a lot of the surrounding of the molecules, so large subgraphs, often they cannot be applied to new, so they do not generalize well because in new given reactants, they cannot be found. If you make them very simple, in this case, meaning 
focusing very much on the reaction center and not taking a lot of the surrounding atoms, then these rules can be applied in many places in a single molecule or to many molecules and they also do not perform well. So this is, has been used uh, for quite some time and uh, we will see that many methods in her now built on these reaction rules. Uh, translation uh, is, a very, is a very good idea to use this translation techniques. So it's a very direct way to approach the reaction prediction or single steps retrosynthesis problem. And this came together with this sequence to sequence learning methods or transformers. So in natural language processing, what's from starting from 2016, 17, what suddenly started to work is sequence to sequence learning. So you basically have pairs like here, a sentence in, in French and a sentence in Engl English. And you have many of them, you have large databases and you use a so-called transformer method, which is a deep neural network with a special design. So uh, uh, queries, keys and values and so on and, and, and attention heads. But anyway, so this encodes the input sentence and then decodes it. And these methods are extremely good at translating, for example, English to French. And so there was a huge boost in natural language processing and you can also see the chemical predicting chemical reactions as a kind of translation problem, meaning that you take the products as a, the reactants as input language and the products as output language. So, okay, so you say my reactants are the French language and products are the English language and I try to translate. And this became known uh, by, as molecular transformer and also here, you basically have pairs of reactants and products in a database. You feed them into this molecular transformer. Of course, you have to adjust this machine learning method. It doesn't work from the get-go, but uh, it can then uh, be used for new reactants. You, you plug in new reactants and it gives you the most likely products. And also the other way around, you can also train it the other way around and provide products. And the method gives you the most likely reactants. So what you see here are molecules or multiple reactants uh, in the so-called SMILES language. It looks a bit strange, but these are molecules. It's a very direct and I would also say elegant way to come from reactants to products or the other way around. It's also highly accurate. So at reaction prediction, which is this forward case, it's 90% correct. And however, it makes it a bit difficult to inspect for chemists because you don't have an intermediate step where you know which chemical rule is applied, which, why is it transformed in that way? So you just plug something in and, uh, and give something out. I'm also simplifying, of course, uh, these researchers have also worked on trying to get more of interpretation out of that. Then classification approaches is, um, I think that's also a quite nice idea. So again, the problem is to, uh, let's say forward, given uh, a certain uh, input molecule predict the outcome. But in this case, because there are so many possible molecules, you cannot, and they are all different, you cannot just formulate the classification task. But what you can do is you can put each of these reaction rules, reaction templates as a, a class. So you would have a neural network that has, let's say you have a database of thousand reaction templates. And these are then your categories, your classes. You plug in a molecule and you predict which template is to be applied and then you pick this template and you apply it formally and transform because the template says how to transform so here for example the template says that this particular substructure is converted to carbon nitrogen and here if i apply this template to this molecule i see that the that this subgraph fits here and makes the change here so this means uh, whether, whenever it's realistic or not, whatever, whether it's realistic or not, this uh, might be to discuss, but this reaction template, this reaction rule can be applied to this molecule and gives this output. So there can be thousands of templates. Once again, the idea. So you plug in the molecule here, it can be a graph neural network, or you can uh, calculate the scriptors and fingerprints and plug in a fully connected network. So different options here, but each of the output units stands for one of the reaction templates. And so overall, the function uh, that is used here, you have uh, you plug in a molecule M 
we have a molecule encoder HM, and then we have a W, a weight matrix of the last layer, where each row represents one of the reaction templates. And softmax means that you basically go, um, you have uh, outputs between zero and one, and the highest output is the most likely template, or so what the model thinks would be the most likely reaction template. So the idea is to use uh, reactants as input to the deep neural network and to predict the reaction template and then to apply this reaction template to get to the products or to the reactants. And so this is the classification approach I already explained. So you have a molecule encoder in, in W. So this is a matrix of adaptive parameters and each row represents a reaction template and each row is also freely adjustable. So this means that reaction template one and two are completely dissimilar. They are what we say one hot encoded. Uh, yeah, this was used in several works, starting with uh, only uh, back in 2016, with only 16 expert coded templates, then extended by Marvin to thousands of uh, automatically uh, extracted templates and uh, also other works that pre train on the applicability of a template and so on. So, um, this is also uh, a paper that uh, is very interesting to us and where our work started when we saw this. So with this classification approach, um, you can look at how good the method is on particular reaction classes. And here you see you have reaction classes where you have zero number of training examples. So for some reaction classes, for some reaction rules, you have a lot of examples. So these are frequent reactions that chemists like to use multiple times and, and they appear very often. But then there are also chemical reactions that are very rare uh, and appear rarely. And here the methods are very bad. So that's what we found uh, when we read this paper and where my PhD student came up with a very cool idea. He said, they're very bad at zero shot. And, and then I told him, yes, it's clear because you don't have any examples in the training set. So it must be because of machine learning uh, you will very, will not be very good because you don't have examples. But what you have is maybe similar chemical reactions. And this is something that you can explore. And why is this also problematic um, that you're very bad at uh, for chemical reactions where you have only few examples? Because those are the frequent ones. So in the databases, USPTO small and large, you see that you have a lot of reaction templates that occur uh, the very rarely. So that's actually the large part of that. So um, here uh, you can use a new technique uh, instead of classification, a so-called retrieval technique. And this is based on uh, associative networks, so-called Hopfield networks that were already there in the 80s that learned to retrieve from the database. So you have a noisy version of something that you have in, in storage and you want to retrieve the full image from the store or the full sample from the storage. You have a noisy, this is your database and you have a noisy version of one of the things stored in the database and you want to retrieve it. And um, this is uh, work usually done on, in, on binary inputs. Uh, so usually these are uh, binary things and this has recently been extended to continuous uh, uh, versions. So these are, now you can consider them as uh, deep learning layers where usually a normal deep learning layer completely freely transforms the molecule or the input. Whereas a Hopfield network has to compare in each layer to, uh, to stored to a storage, so kind of memory. And therefore um, it's a bit more constrained and overall this is energy based. Um, it's continuous now, so there are continuous versions of more Hopfield networks where they were binary before, and um, these are available for such retrieval tasks. So what, you, what we basically changed here, and this is also very much simplified, is we have a, they, we, we see direction templates as a, a database. We encode them. So this is, this is new here that each of the templates are encoded by a neural network you get to a new representation, a new space, and you also encode the molecule and you see there's a noisy version of the template and you try to retrieve the correct template from this memory of reaction templates. 
So if you look at the, at the function here where you had a freely learnable weight matrix for each row corresponded to a template, we now have a neural network that maps the template to, uh, uh, to a representation. This means that you also have that similar templates have a similar representation and they are not all different anymore. Again, coming to a bit of math. So uh, we still have the molecule encoder that takes the molecule and input, but then we also have a template encoder that is, can be a similar neural network that takes as input the string or the smart string reaction smarts and transforms it into a vectorial representation. Actually, this is not the whole, so this is a, a very simple technique that was uh, for zero shot learning that was invented like already 2008, 2009. So uh, the basic idea to represent the class, to have a, class, a description of the class and, and map it into some space. Uh, with the Hopfield network, it's actually more complicated. So you have multiple layers again, you have more uh, heads that are learned to retrieve, you have key and query mechanism. So it's a bit more powerful. However, conceptually, it's relatively simple to implement. So you have a template encoder, a molecule encoder, you use a, a Hopfield layer, and then you get a prediction vector that you plug into uh, cross entropy. So with this pseudocode, you could, in theory, implement it in, in a few lines of code. Um, so does this work at all? So these are the four principal approaches that I would say could be identified. And now let's see how, how these things work usually. So there is what is usually done here is a data set based on a US patent office, USPTO, and there is a small version with around 40,000 samples and around 10,000 reaction templates and a larger version with, with around uh, 400,000 samples. Uh, in order to compare the previous methods, of course, we use predefined preprocessing and split, and we use relatively simple molecule and template encoder that extract different types of fingerprints and descriptors and map with a fully connected network. And these are the results. So what you see here is uh, different methods. Um, this classic, this DNN would be the classification approaches. And then you see, especially here for the chemical reactions, uh, for the reaction templates where there is zero examples in the training set, uh, we could strongly improve. And you see these are also these categories here. You see with the gray bars, these are reactions that are uh, that occur uh, sparsely, but actually in total, there are many of them. And here, especially, and especially these methods improves a lot. Uh, on USPTO 50K and USPTO small, um, uh, we also, uh, there is a lot of methods reported, performance metrics, um, top one accuracy mean, mean that uh, you have, the methods have only one best guess uh, what could be the outcome of the of the single step retrosynthesis? So here, other methods are better than starting from uh, top three. So each method has three chances, three guesses. What could be the outcome of the chemical reaction or the single step retrosynthesis? We start outperforming other methods, and so these are both template based and template free methods. And similar things on uh, USPTO full and. Of course, we also performed an ablation study to see whether this switching from a fully connected network from the classification approach to the retrieval approach to the modern hot field network has improved. And this is here the critical step as we saw in this ablation study. You can also compare these methods with respect to the speed. Um, it depends on whether the, the inference speed, so how fast you can make the predictions plays a role at all. Maybe you have time to wait um, but these are also these techniques uh, are also very uh, efficient. So these uh, green bars are classification approaches. They are a bit faster than the MHN, the modern Hopfield approaches. However, uh, so uh, GLN is conditional graph not logic network uh, is a method that also checks whether um, uh, the reaction template is formally ap applicable and takes some time here, and the transformer has much more operations to do, and therefore it's also quite slower. Uh, for some for some of you that follow the general machine learning trends, I don't know how many do that. So um, there is also 
quite a big trend currently is in machine learning and computer vision in general about contrastive learning. And here there's a particular relation of, of our method um, to contrastive learning. So contrastive learning means that you have, uh, you learn to contrast positive pairs to, to have similar representations against um, unmatched pairs to have dissimilar representations. And you could also see a uh, few this as what we have done as contrastive learning approach. So we try to find uh, a space where our mappings of molecules and reaction templates, where if the template goes together with is, is correct for this molecule or fits with the molecule, should have similar representation. And if it doesn't fit, is not applicable and, and is not appropriate for this molecule, it should be dissimilar. And from the perspective of these attention mechanisms, you could view this method as learning to attend to you, ex, you have an external memory of reaction templates and you learn to put your, you to attend to particular ones within that memory. Okay, so um, I hope there you have uh, noted already many questions down. So there, uh, I'm coming already to the conclusions. So for I uh, focused again on a, on a particular area of um, chemical uh, reactivity, so predicting so reaction prediction or single step retrosynthesis for several deep learning methods. Very good deep learning methods are available. I started with explaining what these reaction rules do. So I would not say they are machine learning methods, but these are transformation rules that have been a method that's, that is around for quite a while. And um, here this chemically transferred. So they, these are intuitive like blueprints, how a reaction uh, runs. So they encode these chemical reactions in a symbolic form that you can execute on a, on a graph. And then there are these translation approaches, what I call translation approaches, um, which uh, try to model this as a kind of translation task between one language and another. This is the language of re reactants and products. Then classification approaches, also multiple methods that see each uh, reaction category as a different class and then try to predict the correct reaction rule and then execute the reaction rule symbolically. So one thing that I didn't mention and that is quite uh, intriguing, I would say these methods are also instances of neural symbolic uh, AIs. So the, the reaction rule is something sim symbolic that you execute and the neural component is how to pick the correct um, reaction rule. And then uh, yeah, I presented a retrieval approach where you consider the set of templates as a database from which you have to retrieve the correct one that kind of combines the reaction rule and classification approach a bit and um, it has good predictive quality. It's computationally very fast and the advantage is um, if someone has a bit of a different reaction template database or wants to use expert coded rules, uh, the method, the model can be used without uh, retraining. The code is available here on this GitHub page. The link should work. And I leave you with a couple of references. You have even more references uh, here, of course, in the paper and in, in the library that are linked at the beginning. Yes. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Günther, for a very good overview of this field. Um, there's a question from Chris about the conditionality and, well, making relative statements, right? What happens if in the data? Chris, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, well, one of the uh, reaction examples in incl includes a nitro group, which is reduced to an anilin. Yeah. The start material also contains a chloro group, which under some conditions would also be reduced. So yeah. how do you flag potential problems with a reaction? Yeah, so I, I think maybe I picked, I didn't pick a very good example. <laughs> and uh, it's, so I think it relates back to, to what I said about simplification. So in uh, why exactly this is it. So this is probably, if, if I show it here, this has been probably in some database and there is potentially more information about reaction conditions, um, catalysts and so on. and I don't know, maybe it's also, uh, I don't know which reaction would run. If you have like a lot of chemical reactions, there could be even like a disagreement uh, within the database. You would learn to predict the average. So the, what people most likely reported. So the, if, 
if different um, contributors are to the database, then you kind of average between them. And, and, and I think this is one of the problematic uh, things that currently usually reaction conditions are not considered. And there is a lot of ambiguity. And I think uh, therefore, if it depends on what other chemical reactions are in the database, uh, this determines what your method would learn and which reaction template which we picked. But, but you would get, so the method would basically give you a list of, of reaction templates that the method thinks is appropriate. So you would see the reaction that you have in mind, you would see maybe in second or third place. But I don't know, and maybe it's not a good example. So I'm, I'm not so much uh, into chemical reactions. So maybe, maybe other examples would have been better. Okay, thanks very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but it's quite realistic, right? Uh, because it depends on whatever temperature or substrate or whatever is the case here, right? It's yeah. quite a realistic example, though, right? Um, and one, uh, so Gloris just says, just uh, thanks for the amazing lectures. Um, so one question from my side, Gunda, you've been yeah. in the field now for ten years or so, right? Yeah. It looked at images, for example, right? Reaction prediction and so yeah. on. Um, so how do you actually judge the impact in the fields where AI has made an impact, or where do you think it might make? Uh, the biggest impact in the near future? I mean, how, how do you address that? Or what did you see? And what do you think will happen in the near future? I mean, real impact um, yeah. on drug discovery, basically. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, but um, what is your opinion? Yeah, it's yeah, subjective, yeah, right? Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. So, so what I think is that, um, yeah, in these areas with uh, chem where there's a lot of data, it has already had quite an impact. So I think the chemical reaction databases, activity prediction, um, there has already been uh, quite an impact, especially also where, the, where there are microscopy images. I think uh, the next uh, big things are like uh, fusion, so to make this more generalizable to fusion. So at the moment, people would use this, for example, the activity and property prediction methods, mostly if they have, have a lot of data. But I think. Uh, with the new fusion learning and, and, and zero shot learning techniques, you could also see uh, have methods that do a bit of a dark magic. So you show the method, maybe one active, two inactives, and it comes up with a quite good model of uh, quite good QSA model on its own. So I think the next thing would be probably still in, in the area of activity property prediction, but focusing on, on, on very few data. Um, since there's also, yeah, there are, um, I think it depends uh, also a bit on where data is produced. So uh, if there's a, a strong um, trend also to produce a lot, to produce and open, especially the like microscopy data, I think there could be a huge push in, in this direction. So whenever, the, let, let's for example here, this if, if the reaction databases wouldn't be out like USPTO, uh, also, people would have a, a very hard time developing methods. So since this uh, original works like Robert Lowe preparing all and extracting the, this data sets from USPTO, this was a huge benefit for the community because people could jump on it. So uh, it's a bit guided. So I would say the next big things are a bit guided by, by where data will be available. And yes, I would, I think uh, there's something else. Yes, and third, so first thing is, uh, I think, few shot, uh, zero shot learning. Second thing is where data comes up maybe in uh, more uh, microscopy images. Third big thing, and it's, all, it's also already there, all these geometric uh, deep learning approaches. So learning on, on point clouds, we have, have the, uh, method of the science breakthrough of the year, AlphaFold, comes from the area of geometric deep learning, I would say, so learning on these point clouds. And there is a huge, there was a huge boost there. So now uh, we can look at, at the point clouds uh, of, of, of proteins and ligands and have all these equivariant and invariant graph neural networks. So I think this, where this classical physical simulations, molecular docking and so on have been used now the deep learning, geometric deep learning will come in and, and improve that. So that's, I think that's, it's also something that is basically already there, but this will, over the next years, this will get much better. These methods will get much better and will become more prominent. Yeah. 
So three yeah, shots. Thanks. I have three shots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. I agree on the data. Yeah, I still remember the times before Campbell and PubChem. Yeah, there were yeah. virtual screening data sets with, I don't know, 800 examples that were selected by hand. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. the state of the art until 10 or 15 years ago when it came to data sets there. I still remember that as well. Yeah, thanks. And uh, there's one point about uh, making the uh, reference papers of the slides. I think, Gunda, if you want to make the slides available, just send them to me. I will put them on the event yes, website perfect. if that's okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, I will put them on the website. And Manas, you have a question as well. Do you want to uh, elaborate? Uh, right. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned template-based models for yeah. translation, right? So I was wondering if uh, this has been tried on structure generation, sequence to sequence generation. Um, trans uh, you mean the some translation methods on these reaction templates? Uh, right. Sing uh, single step rate for synthesis. Yes, uh, I, if I understand, yeah, I think there have been some works to try to to learn or to generate new templates. So I also like the idea that's a bit intriguing that like the AI comes up with new chemical reactions. There were one or two papers, and I think there was just just yesterday or today morning I saw something coming up on archive. Yes, so people start thinking about that. To use these generative models for text or also translation approaches if you could uh, name it like that to come up to combine them with uh, reaction templates and come up with new reaction templates so that's a, that would be another way to combine these uh, two different streams yes so there are, i think that's that's around since there are a few publications that do that yeah yeah if i understand thanks, you Manas. correctly <laughs> Thanks, Gunnar. Does it answer your question, Manas? Or? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Gunnar. Yeah, Will also appreciates the lectures. Thanks, Will. Um, Moritz, uh, do you want to read your question or explain that? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if there have been attempts. Well, I, I suppose it, it has been yes. sort of asked before uh, about like yeah. reaction conditions. But has there been an attempt to supplement like these string-based methods, which um, I suppose implicitly treat the molecules as like equilibrium structures? There's no yes. geometric yes. information. Has there been attempts to incorporate, for example, quantum mechanical descriptors or yes. like these geometric descriptors? Yes, exactly. There is, uh, I can remember one publication where they tried to improve this with quantum chemical descriptors. Maybe there is more publications now. And I try, I try, I'm trying to remember who did this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this with the quantum chemical descriptors. Uh, it's probably, uh, yeah. my bet is on, on the Connor Coley group, but it could also be, could also be Marvin uh, Siegler's group or uh, maybe Philip Schwaller. So uh, I hope I, no one is offended now. <laughs> I don't remember the paper, but yeah, it, I think it has even quantum dis chemical descriptors in, in the title. So I might find okay. it. Yeah. Please send me an email. So <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> <All right. memorize. laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Clara just mentioned that Philip Schwaller is actually on the call. Philip, was it your paper? Well, Philip? It wasn't mine. Uh, okay. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's uh, probably called McCauley, I would say. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, Marie also appreciates the talks. Um, there are no more questions here in the chat. Um, any other oral questions from anyone? Yeah, otherwise, um, thanks a lot, Gunther. Uh, yeah, an excellent thanks, talk. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Um, Thank you very much to both of yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Also, uh, Floriano, there's just a link to the paper Thank that you. might be the one that was uh, you were just looking for. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone, for attending. Uh, please put the 5th of May uh, into a calendar for our next meeting. We will circulate the program shortly. Um, please stay on the line. Thanks a lot from uh, Andrea, Clara, as well as myself for attending. Uh, please stay on the line. Uh, so we'll put people into breakout rooms. Uh, so you can just have a chat with five, six, seven people from the field. Yeah, uh, meet old friends, meet new ones as well. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone, for attending. Hope to see you next time then. Thank you.